Everybody say Jesus with me. One, two, three. Jesus. Come on. One, two, three. Jesus. Oh, there's power in that name, isn't there? We are starting a brand new sermon series today. And yes, we started a new series on Labor Day weekend. Don't ask me why, but we did. But we're glad to see you today. We're starting this series entitled Satan Hates. And today we're dealing with the subject Satan Hates Unity. Satan Hates Unity. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So I want to ask you to go ahead and find your place in Acts chapter 4 and also John chapter 17. Acts chapter 4 and uh, also John chapter 17. How many of you know that, um, that the devil, Satan, is real? You don't have to be a child of God very long, not very long at all, living for Jesus with everything within you to discover real fast that the devil is alive and well. Come on, right? Y'all talk to me now today. Are you going to talk to me? Say it. Come on, amen. The devil is alive and well. But let me tell you something. Before you get all scared and you start trembling in your boots today, can I remind you that Jesus Christ has won the war at the cross? You don't have to be afraid of the devil. But the devil is out to kill, steal, and destroy your life. He wants to make your life ineffective. And one of the ways he does that in the church today, all across America, is by using disunity in the body. Disunity in the body. Did you know that there are more than 900 churches that will close their doors this year in America? I mean, for the very last time, they'll open their doors, they'll have some type of worship. Maybe that church at one point ran four, five, six hundred people and they're down to nine. They're down to eight. They're down to a handful of dear, precious little ladies. And that particular Sunday, they go in, they have their little Bible study, they have their worship experience the best that they can possibly do. But because they cannot pay the bills and they can't keep the doors open, nine hundred. 100 churches, get this, 900 churches will close their doors in America every year. Seven out of ten churches today in America are on the decline. Seven out of ten. Guys, we are living in a day today where people just do not want to go to church. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir because you wanted to come or you wouldn't be here today. Right? Unless somebody dragged you. That's okay. By the end of the service, you'll be glad you came. Amen? But, but seven out of ten churches are declining, and people today in our society don't want to go to church. As a matter of fact, if you get up on a Sunday morning and you uh, get out on the bypass, and uh, if the bypass is open, by the way, if you, you know what I'm saying, if you go out on the bypass, man, you can get pretty much anywhere you want to get it's easy as you want to get there. Why? Because everybody's sleeping in. 70 to 80 percent of people in Jackson and West Tennessee, yes, even in the Bible Belt, the belt buckle of the Bible Belt, Jackson, Tennessee, people just don't go to church. Now, if you'd ask some folks, why, why do, why do you not go to church? Why, why, why do you not attend a local church, whether it's a Baptist, a non-denominational, a Methodist, a Presbyterian, a Pentecostal, whatever denomination or line that you have had some type of experience with in the past, if you were to ask a lot of people, why do you, why do you not go to church? You know what many of them will tell you? Because I've been there before. Yeah, I said it. He said, I can't believe you would say that. That's what the world says. The world says, I don't go to church because I've been there before. And when I was there, I came in during a B -B Baptist business meeting. Has anybody ever been in a Baptist business meeting? Now, thank God for the Baptist churches and the Methodist churches and whatever denomination that you come out of. Thank God that when they have business meetings, some of them, not all churches have business meetings. We don't do that here. But when those churches have business meetings, not all of them, praise God, or not all of them, you know, are, uh, are, are full of arguments and 
and fussing and disagreements, but a lot of times that happens in our churches. And so sometimes people go to church and they're in the midst of that. Man, they hear people arguing about stuff like the, the color of the carpet or, or the color of the, uh, of the curtains in the bathroom or they, they're fighting over this or they're fighting over that. They fight over whether you ought to wear blue jeans to church or you have to wear a tie. They fight over which version of the Bible. To, man, people just in the church fight over all kind of stuff. No wonder nobody wants to go to church today. No wonder. In 2006, many of you who have been here for a very long time, if you've been here since the beginning of the church in April of uh, 2014, you know our story. We're going to tell it even more detail in October. Don't miss October because we're going to be presenting something to the church we're excited about. But for those of you that don't know, in in 2006, Tammy and I went down to Dallas, Texas to a pastor's conference, and while we were there, God planted in our spirit a seed, a desire, a God-sized dream. It wasn't a small dream, it was a big dream. And I began to share this dream with other people, and so many of them did not believe this would really come to fruition, and I just want to tell you folks, we serve a big, big, big God. God gave us a dream to, here it is, God gave us a dream to plant a church united around one thing, united around doing whatever it takes to win a lost world to Jesus Christ. United around one thing, winning a lost world to Jesus Christ. Let me ask you something, why did the early church, the church in the book of Acts, why did they grow and explode and win their world to Jesus Christ? Why? Why did they grow so rapidly and win so many? I'll tell you why. Because they had a singular focus. They were united in purpose. And that purpose was to do whatever it took to reach people far from God. I want to talk to you today over the next few minutes on the subject of Satan hates Unity. Satan hates unity, and he does, because he knows that if a church is unified, if a church is together, if a church has the same common goal and the same common purpose, all of these little peripheral things that really don't matter that much don't matter that much. And, and for so many people in so many churches, those peripheral things that are small and really don't matter very much, they do matter very much, and it takes them off of their aim, and the aim for the church of the living God is supposed to be to win a lost world to Christ. And the reason 900 churches close their doors every year in America is because so many churches have gotten off of the vertical purpose to win a world to Christ, and they've gotten off on these peripheral things, and they've gone horizontal on us, and they're not winning people to Christ. The church is to be unified, and I thank God. You say, why are you preaching this? Are we not unified? Oh, we are, but I think the Bible is very clear that we ought to guard our unity. I've seen church after church after church. I'm telling you the truth, guys. I've been in this thing for a long time. And I've seen church after church after church that God's blessing, the hand of God is upon, and the favor of God is resting upon them, and they are blowing and going and reaching people left and right, and then all of a sudden, the old devil gets his foot in the door, and before you know it, that church that was reaching people and growing is now declining, and before you know it, they're closing their doors for the last time. We have to guard our unity. We have to guard our unity. I want to read to you two passages. First of all, let's read Acts chapter 4, verses 32 and 33. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 and 33. I'm in the New, America, uh, New International Version today. And the Bible says in verse 32, All the believers were one in heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but... But they shared everything they had, watch this, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. 
and much grace was upon them all. I want you to see three things. I hope you write these three things down. Number one, I want you to see the reality of unity. Number two, the results of unity. And number three, the reason for unity. Now let's back up and look at the first one. Number one, the reality of unity. This early church understood unity. They were unified. I mean, they came together. The Bible tells us that in verse 32, which we just read. They were unified. Now, here's the problem today in the American church. We got people that don't understand what the church is for. So many people think that the church exists for me, for us. But can I tell you that we are the church and we exist for the ones that aren't here yet. God has given us a great commission And that great commission says to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every single creature. The reality of unity. The early church got it, they understood it, and they were, praise God, unified. Now, as we think about the early church being unified, and you and I and our church being unified around a singular purpose, I want you to write down three things. Number one, they were family. They were family. You see, they were family because they entered into a relationship with each other. They shared the same spiritual father, God. Now, guys, listen to me. I want you to listen to me. If you listen and say, I'm listening, I want you to hear this. If you're a born-again child of God, in other words, if you've said yes to Jesus and you're a Christ follower in the house today, You are my brother and you are my sister. We have the same father. We're kin. So you may not like me, but you got to love me. Come on, right? Why? Because we're family. You know how it is with family. I got three sisters. Man, when I grew up, I had absolutely zero bathroom time. I was the first one to get up. I've always been an early riser. Man, I was up early, but I had to wait for my sisters to get out of the way. That was back in the day. Guys, you remember this? Ladies, remember back in the day where you had the curling iron, you put it on there, and you climb it. Now now it's flat. I don't know what happened to the curling iron, but now it's going flat. It used to be round. How many remember that? You put it on your hair, you clamp that thing, and you twist it. Oh, some of you still use that. Okay, well, I guess it's okay to do that. My wife's got this flat thing. It's about, I got her, and and by the way, hers broke. She sent me to the store. When I go to the store and I don't know what I'm looking for, you know what I do? I recruit. I see a lady walking by that looks like she knows what she's talking about, and I say, ma'am, 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 my wife, my wife's uh, flattener. What do you call that? Flat iron, straightener, is that what it is, a straightener? I said, my wife's broke. I see that there are about 18 different ones here. Some of them are like this. Some of them are thick. And I'm just, bigger is always better. So I'm thinking, uh-huh, I got to get her the big, thick one. I did. She said, yes, that's, that's the Cadillac version. I, my wife deserves the Cadillac version. All $39. I told her I was so proud. I said, I got you the best one Walmart had. She said, Ronnie, $39, that's not the best one. I said, that's the most expensive one they had. And she came out of the bathroom and her hair was like this. No idea why I'm sharing this story. I remember when I was a kid, though, my, my sister, man, I, I, listen, I love my sisters, but boy, they got on my nerves sometimes. Guys, listen to me. I'm human. I'm your pastor, but I might get on your nerves. You may not like me sometimes, but you got to love me. Why? Because we are family. Say it, loud. Say it out loud. We are family. Turn to the person on your right and say, you got to love me. you got to love me. They were family. They were family. They were family. They shared the same spiritual father. They shared the same spiritual birth. We've been born again. Let me go old school. How many of you have ever heard of Bill and Gloria Gaither? Yeah, all the old people. Amen. The Gaither vocal band. Come on, you remember that? Remember that song? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. How many of you are saying that in church? I'm so glad. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Oh, listen, we are family. Number two, not only are we family, but the early church, they were also friends. 
Boy, I love this. They did things together. They did life together. They hung out together. They entered into a fellowship with each other. They shared their lives and their possessions with each other. They, they met physical needs and practical needs that were evident. That's, listen, that's the reason that we started dinner parties in our church. If you're new to our church, dinner parties are our small groups. We don't call them prayer meetings or Bible studies or, or life groups. Or so many churches call them different things. We call them dinner parties. Why? Because we like to eat. Right? But we, we get together in small groups. Listen, you don't grow spiritually in rows. You grow spiritually in circles. And you in, encourage each other. And you edify each other. And you build each other up. And that's what the church is to be about. Friends. Friends. They met physical and practical needs. They were that were evident in their life. They shared their lives together. You can't, in this place, in this atmosphere, in this setting, you cannot just be completely open with everybody, first of all, because I've got the mic. But in a smaller setting, you can share your needs and you can share your hurts and your pains and your uh, things that are hurting you and bothering you and people can pray for you. And, and, and we love dinner parties because that's the pastoral arm of our church. When somebody's hurting, that's why you need to get plugged into a dinner party. So when something's going on in your life, somebody knows about it and they can check on you. They can pray for you. They were friends. Chuck Swindoll, the great preacher, said this, and I quote. It's very interesting. He said, churches need to be less like national shrines and more like bars. Now just think about this for a second. Some of you, your antenna, your spiritual antenna, your churchy antenna went up. Bars, wait, time out. Well, just listen to this. This is interesting. Churches need to be less like national shrines and more like bars, less like, less, less like untouchable cathedrals and more like well-used hospitals, places to bleed in rather than monuments to look at. Places where you can take your mask off. You ever been in a bar? Don't raise your hand. Man, people in, by the way, it, it really bothers me when I drive by a bar or a club or something and there's more cars than there are in the average church. It bothers me. But you know why that is? Because so many bars and joints like that, people can take their mask off and they can just be real. You ever sit, don't, don't raise your hand, but have you ever said, I've not ever done this, but you ever sat next to somebody in a bar, I, I, I've heard this before, people just share with you everything. Maybe because they're a little tipsy, I don't know. But they open up and they share. And listen, the church, in the church, we, have, we, we, we want everybody to think our lives are put together. Guess what, folks? We're messed up. Chuck Swindoll said, let me just finish reading this. I get off. Churches need to be less like national shrines and more like bars. Less like untouchable cathedrals and more like well-used hospitals. Places to bleed in rather than monuments to look at. Places where you can take your mask off and let your hair down. A place where you can have your wounds dressed. That's what the church is to be about. You see, friend, the early church, they were unified. They were family. They were friends, but they were also followers, followers of Christ. And they had entered into a partnership with each other. These people shared an enterprise together. These people, watch this, they didn't meet just for family gatherings. They, they didn't meet just for Baptist casserole. How many know what a Baptist casserole is? A ba- Let me tell you what, I, if you don't know, a ba- and I know this because I learned this because I was in full-time evangelism. You guys remember this. I was in full-time evangelism for four years. I traveled all across America, and I went in every country church and mid-sized church and even some larger churches for four years. And, and almost after every service, they had a fellowship meal. And most of them, these little churches, they were downstairs below the worship center in this fellowship hall down in the, I call it, you know, the dungeon, downstairs. And I remember one church, I went to this, uh, uh, after church, they said, you're staying for Fellowship Mill, aren't you, preacher? Uh, Well, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went downstairs and we ate and everything, they opened up uh, all the lids on these Pyrex things, you know, and they all had crumbled up Ritz crackers on top. 
You know what a Baptist casserole is? You don't have a clue what's down inside. Everything's got Ritz crackers on top. One church I was in, just, just because I want to tell this story, and I've got the mic. Well, I went to this church, the same church, and after we got through eating, they said, hey, be back at 5 tonight because the service starts at 6. We're going to eat again. I'm like, oh, my goodness gracious. So, I, I, no kidding, I get back, I get back at Five minutes until five, I walk in the worship center. I go down the basement, and I walk down there, and, and, and all 18 of them are there. And I notice that there's this big, huge, king-size white sheet that's draped over the island that all the food was on that morning. I mean, I thought they were serving the Lord's Supper. I didn't know what they were doing. They took it off. And it was all those same dishes. They didn't even put them in the refrigerator. We started eating again. I'm still here. I guess it's okay. Followers, followers. Now, this is interesting. They didn't just meet together to have a meal. Nothing wrong with eating. Thank God for that. They didn't just meet together just to make sure that their needs were met. They came together to obtain an objective, a purpose. They were partners in reaching the world for Christ. They are, they, they are all from different backgrounds and different interests, but they all have the same purpose. And the purpose, here it is, this is the same purpose that Soul Quest Church was started and planted, and God gave us a stream for it. What was it? So that we would be unified around a purpose, and the purpose is to reach people that are not here yet. Amen? Well, if you're going to clap, go ahead and clap. Amen? You see, they were family, they were friends, and they were followers, the reality of unity. But number two, I want you to see the result of unity. Verse 33, verse 33, the Bible says, and watch this, with great power, everybody say power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace, or I like with the King James, I think it says favor, was upon them all. What's the result of unity? What, what is the result when the church comes together in unity around a purpose? What, what happens? There's power there. Number one, there's power. There's God's power. Not your power, not my power, but God's power. You see, purpose is the power in the engine of life. Without purpose, there is activity really without accomplishment. And the power was evident by the growth of the church. Now, guys, if you go back and look in the beginning of the book of Acts, you see that this church, the early church, began with 120 people. Well, those who know, historians tell us that this early church grew to somewhere around 100,000 people in just about 25 years. Well, I just don't like a big church. Well, you wouldn't have liked the early church. Man, I've had people come to our church from time to time and visit, and they say, well, I'm, you know, I'm coming from this other church over in Jackson, this big church or that big church, because we don't like big church. We just get lost in the crowd. Well, first of all, you won't get lost in the crowd if you get plugged into a small group. You won't get lost in the crowd if you get on a serve team. You won't get lost in the crowd if you get in a dinner party. Guys, listen, and, and I just want to, I want to so bad, but I just kind of have, try, my wife says, Ronnie, have tact. I used to not have any. Tact, that is. But I try to have more as I've matured, but I want to say so bad. Well, listen, you're not going to like Soul Quest Church because we're not going to stay a small church. Because as long as people are lost and don't have a relationship with Jesus, we're going after them. We're going to do everything within our power to get them under the sound of the gospel so that their life can be changed. And if you're here today and you have never said yes to Jesus, I've got the best news in the world for you. God loves you. Jesus died for you. And you can say yes to him today and he'll change your life. And, the, and when we, we are unified, there's power there. There's power. The early church had power. They had power in their growth. But they also had power 
that was evident by their ability to withstand satanic attack. Guys, listen to me. When a church is unified, the devil is going to try his best to divide. All you, listen, most of you, what you see is what you see on Sunday morning. But can I tell you, the old devil has tried his very best to stop this movement called Soul Quest Church. He's tried to stop it. And there have been many, many times, and I even have looked in the mirror and say, Ronnie, what are we doing? And God reminds me, you're not doing anything. I'm doing it. You just be obedient to me. Many, many times. There's been a few times where <laughs> it's gotten so bad, I'm like, God, God, if you don't do something, and God always does something. I remember those days in the very beginning when we had 20, 30, 40 people. And we would space those chairs out at the Star Center so it didn't look like a Sunday school class. Man, we take those metal plastic, those plastic chairs. You know those chairs, those of you that were with us at the Star Center. You remember those plastic chairs, don't you? Man, we would, we would space those things out and put about five or six inches in between each chair. And then we would have aisles that, man, you could dance and done flips in because we wanted to spread it out to make it look bigger than we had. Listen, we had no people. We paid $450 a week in rent. There were Sundays we brought in $258.16. The devil's tried to stop this thing. Over and over and over and over again, he's tried to stop it. But I'm here to tell you, everybody listen to me, look at me, look at me. I'm going to ask unless it's absolutely an emergency, please don't be moving around. Listen to me, I'm telling you the devil has tried to stop this thing, but I'm telling you, greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. The devil can't stop what God starts. We're in it to win it, amen? We got, a, we got a goal, we got a purpose, we got something that unites us. And when we do and we stay united and we continue to move forward for the glory of God and we stay focused around the vision and the mission that God has given us from way back in 2006, I'm telling you, friend, the power of God is going to fall and rest upon this church. The early church, the result of their unity was there was power. Power for growth, power for sa to withstand satanic attack because he's real. But also there was power. The power was evident by their finding strength in the midst of their diversity. You see, unity doesn't mean that we all are exactly alike. Because we're different, aren't we? Aren't we? Yeah, you don't look like me and you said, praise Jesus. Their diversity could divide them or their diversity could empower them. They were not all alike. They had different opinions. They had different giftings. They looked different. Listen, guys, I thank God that this church is not a white church. I thank, this, I thank God this church is not a black church or a Hispanic church or African American church or an Oriental church. I thank God this is a people church and it's a place where we can come no matter what you look like, what your background is, what color your skin is, you can come to this place and worship King Jesus. <laughs> diversity. God gave them power in their diversity. <laughs> We're all different. We're all different. We all look different. Some of us have no hair. Some of you I'm jealous of. Yeah, Stephen Stegall, I'm talking to you, brother. Stand up. Flip that hair around. Flip it around. Turn, let me see. Look at that. Woo! Yeah, I'm just jealous, that's all. Man, I'm telling you, we are different. Praise God for our difference. You see, the result of unity is God's power. Number two, the result of unity is God's favor. Because they were unified in their purpose, God smiled, out, smiled down on them. Grace means unmerited love or unmerited favor. Because they were generous, God was generous back to them. If we want God's blessings to continue to fall upon our church, if we want the favor of God to rest upon us, we need first to be obedient to his purpose. Be obedient to his 
purpose. The reality of unity. Number two, the result of unity. And number three, the reason for unity. And to find that, I want you to go with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter 17. What is the reason for unity? I love this. The Bible says this is Jesus. He's praying for us. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, and they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to compassion Complete unity, watch this, to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. The reason God wants you and I and our church to be unified is so that the world on the outside will look at us and they won't see those Christians in the body of Christ fighting and fussing and cussing each other out and all the stuff that goes on in so many churches today. No, they see a unified church. A unified church. I was, uh, every Sunday morning, I'm sure all of you know, most of you know this, every Sunday morning at 6 o'clock, we have a team that gets here and they help us put these stages up, and it's a real deal. It's a real, real, real job, a real task to do. And if you're looking for something to do and you'd like to join the setup team and you're an early riser and you've got a, a little bit of muscle, you'd like to help, uh, go to the Invisible Black Ten right after the service. We'd love for you to get plugged in. But we have a group of men, and... and uh, Sometimes a couple of ladies that show up at six and they put all this stuff up and that's why it's important for you to get a sign and, and uh, help us out because these stages, man, this is so heavy. Why? Because we did everything on the cheap because we're a church plant. We don't have just money rolling. But I, I love the conversations I get to get in to on um, Sunday mornings. Sometimes I can, there are conversations I can share with you and sometimes I can't. But um, I'm trying to think who it was. Justin. Justin Jones. Justin, where are you at, Justin? Yeah, Justin. The ball headed guy back there. Yeah. I was having a conversation with Justin. Justin is, uh, and Reiner, they're doing a um, dinner party this semester, right? And they had a dinner party this last time. I think he had nine or so. Nine, nine, nine or so. 12? Okay, I tried to cheat you then. Okay, well, nine adults maybe? Is that what it was? Okay. I love this. Justin, how long y'all been? Shout it out. How long y'all been coming here? One year. Justin has bought, they've bought into where we're going. They're unified together with the purpose and the call and the vision and the mission of the church. How do you know that? I'll tell you how I know that because Justin comes to me and says, hey, you know, this is what we did in our dinner party. So what? He said, when we got to prayer time, we ask everybody to share with the group one person that's lost that needs Christ. One person that's lost. And we're going to hold ourselves accountable in our group that before this semester of of dinner parties is over with, we want to see at least how many of them come to Christ and get Five, 50 percent, so four and a half people. We want to see four or five people, though of these that we're praying for, come to this church, hear the gospel and stand and give their life to Jesus Christ. You know what I think about that? I think, wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. Guys, listen, we don't have to be just alike. 
We don't have to talk alike. We don't have to look alike. We don't have to come from the same backgrounds. If you want to walk in here with a three-piece suit on, go for it. I thought this, this uh, family fun day, I thought I would just dress like a preacher for a change. Y'all wouldn't even know me, would you? If you want to come in blue jeans and a t-shirt, you're welcome. We're different. But what unites us, watch this, what unites us, first of all, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And number two is the thing that he told us before he ascended into heaven. He said, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every, 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 every creature. That's what unites us. And until we win Jackson and Gibson County and Crockett County and Carroll County and Chester County, they really need Jesus, and Henderson County. Come on, what other county did I leave out? Weekly County. Until we win West Tennessee and the world for Jesus Christ, we got work to do. We want to be united, be united, be united as a church until, oh, my friend, Jesus comes back and he looks at Soul Quest Church and he says, well done, good and faithful servants. If you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus, some of you, man, <laughs> some of you, You've tried everything in the world to bring you peace. Look at me. I'm done. You've tried everything in the world to fill a void in your life. Everything. You've done it all. You, listen to me. You've tried drugs and you've tried alcohol and you've tried sex and you've tried relationship after relationship after relationship. You've tried all these things to fill this God-shaped void in your life. And nothing ever seems to work. You are the reason we started this church. Why? So we could share with you today a simple message. Here it is. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. It's a simple message. God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only God. You say, well, time out. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. You don't know, you don't know where I was last night. No, I don't know, and I don't care. But I know somebody who knows everything about you, and he still loves you. It's God the Father, and he sent his son, Jesus, to die for your sins. God loves you. Jesus died for you. And he wants you to respond to him today. All he wants you to do is say yes. Say yes. If we call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. He wants you to say yes to him today. Would you be willing today to turn your back on your old lifestyle and to turn to Jesus and say, save me and change me? Would you? Would you? He wants you to. He wants you to come into the fold. He wants to love on you and encourage you and help you through these difficult days that you're going through right now. He'll help you. He may not lift you up and take you out of it, but he'll walk through it with you and give you the strength that you need to make it through if you'll only say yes to Jesus today. That's why we exist as a church, to share with you that message. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Bow your heads. No one's looking around. I'm going to ask you, unless it's absolutely an emergency, please don't move around. Some of you in this place, you've tried everything in the world to bring you peace and joy and happiness, and nothing seems to be working. Jesus, and my friend, always works. <laughs> Jesus, my friend, will touch you and change you. He really will. But you've got to be willing to call out to him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons, the daughters, the children of God. You want to be in the family of God? You want a whole other group of friends in your life? Listen to me. 
You want to get on this team that we're on so we can also go out and share this gospel message with other people that are struggling? Then just simply say yes to him today.